What's up, everybody? Going to be a solo podcast this week. Unfortunately, Ozzy was not able to make it this week. Uh, busy time in the big city, busy time in Gemini season. So I'm sure he'll be back before next week. But he's not missing too, too much with this card this week. Uh, not a whole lot to look forward to on this card, but some, some decent fights overall. Uh, I think there's some okay betting spots, a few underdogs I like. Um, not really too much to recap about the last card. Uh, Ozzy definitely got the better of me in the main event, picking his girl Mackenzie over my girl Angela. Um, that was the fight of the month last year, guys. Uh, best fight, best UFC fight in the entire month of May was Dern winning a 49-44 decision over Angela Hill. So quite the month of fights last month. And uh, we got, I think, four UFC events in the month of June, so we'll be coming uh, with a lot of podcasts. I think there's 12 UFC events in a row coming up, uh, so we'll have lots of, uh, of podcasts and analysis throughout those, so stay tuned for those. And uh, dealing with a little bit of a cough this week as well, so sorry if my voice is a little bit raspy. I'll try to do uh, do my best with it throughout the program, but um, I think we'll keep this one pretty short. I'm going to get you guys out of here in like less than a half hour. So first fight is a fight um, we talked about before in the podcast, light heavyweight division, Maxime Grishin taking on Felipe Linz. Odds for this one. Our Grishin minus 135, Linz plus 115. Uh, the last time this fight was booked, I had a bet on Felipe Linz at plus 152, and it's all the way down to 115 now. So a little bit of a bummer that that fight got canceled last time out. Uh, but my my read is the same. You know, both these guys are pretty old, 38 years old. Linz, uh, you know, recently dropping down to light heavyweight, having some success there. And I just think that Linz's hand speed is a little bit quicker. I think he's going to be quicker to the punch here. Uh, should have a slight striking advantage. And I think if anyone is having like grappling advantage here, hitting takedowns, I think it's probably going to be Linz. I could see a lot of cage pushing and clinching. I probably do expect this fight to go to the decision. But I just think uh, Linz is the side here. I think this line should probably be flipped, honestly. Linz as a slight favorite. I think Grishin had to pull out of the fight last time, not sure why, and then Linz uh, dusted OSP. I guess that's what's affecting the line here is that Linz quickly knocked out OSP, and then he he dropped from plus 150 to plus 115, but I think that Linz is still the side, and I'm going to be on him for at least the unit here at this price. Um, that one should hit the cards, like I mentioned um, no take on other props there, but we're going to move on to the Bantamweight division next. Luan Lacerda taking on Demond Blackshear. Odds for this one, Lacerda minus 150, Blackshear plus 130. Did not see these odds coming at all. You know, Lacerda just one fight removed from being a huge dog to Cody Stamen, and I think he, he looked pretty good in that fight. Um, I just thought coming into the UFC, this guy was a very low-level grappler, just taking down bad grapplers, out-grappling them, and I didn't really think it was going to translate too well to the Cody Stamen fight, but I actually think that his striking looked a lot better in that fight. He just looked like a lot more functional of a fighter. He didn't need takedowns to win. He held his own in, in the, on the feet in that fight. Um... But I just think that this guy is not that good of a grappler. I know he's a black belt, but I just think his level of competition isn't that high. And Blackshear is a guy who is susceptible to being taken down, but I think his defensive grappling, his sweeps, his ability to get up off his back is pretty good. And I think that that's going to be the reason why I'm siding with him here. I just think that this fight on the feet is going to be real close between the two of them. I don't really see a defined edge for either guy. <clears throat> And then on the ground, I could see Luan hitting takedowns here, but uh, Damon is going to work his way back to the feet. He's going to reverse position, sweep, look to submit off his back. And I just think that he's going to be tricky to deal with on the ground here. Uh, so I just think that Damon has a good chance of winning the fight, even if he's getting taken down. And on the feet, it's anyone's guess who's going to get the uh, the advantage here. The length of Blackshear, I could see giving uh, Luan some trouble. Um, but as I mentioned, Luan's striking seems to be improving as well. So um, I just think Luan's getting a little too much credit here off of coming off a loss. And uh, Blackshear, historically, I think is a pretty underrated fighter uh, in the market. 
so I like Blackshear here for a bet. Um, already got some some negative CLV on him though. I, already, I think I bet him plus 120, and uh, he's already up to 130 now. Um, but yeah, I still think he's good for uh, for a bet here. I like two underdogs in a row to start the card, and I'm actually going to keep the, the the ball rolling with that in the third fight. Women's strawweight division: Jinyu Fry taking on Elise Reed. Reed minus 130, Fry plus 110. I'm going to be going with the underdog here again. I think that Fry is the better fighter. Um, you know, much more accomplished, fought the, the the tougher competition throughout her career. She is 38 years old. She is coming off a knockout loss to uh, Poliana Viana. Hilarious knockout, too. I mean, just you don't see anything funnier in MMA than, than that knockout. Um, and that's a little concerning, but I just think that um, <clears throat> Frey should have uh, probably – the advantage on the feet and on the ground here. I definitely think she's the better grappler of the two. I think she's the better wrestler and overall grappler. Elise Reed, very susceptible to getting taken down. And on the feet, Fry is, you know, a decent southpaw striker. I think the, the southpaw looks are going to give Reed some trouble. The straight punches of Jin Yu Fry are pretty solid. And Jin Yu Fry trains at Fortis MMA. She trains with Sam Hughes. Sam Hughes fought Elise Reed and absolutely dominated her hitting takedowns in that fight. So the coaches, everyone around Fry knows what the game plan to beat Elise Reed is. And I just think it's very likely that Fry is going to come out here looking to hit takedowns. And she's done that before. The Gloria DePaula fight. She was allegedly fighting a dangerous striker. What does she do? She comes out and takes her down right away and wins the fight off of a few takedowns. So I just think that she's, she's likely to do the same here. You can't go too crazy on Fry here with a uh, with her being you know 38 coming off that knockout, but I just think that she should be probably uh, the favorite. I think this line should be flipped, and you know at least Reed is a favorite in the UFC. Never thought I'd see it, and I'm certainly never going to bet it. So I think that that it's going to be Fry or Pass here, starting off the card with three underdogs in a row. Next fight is a fun one. Again, a fight we've already talked about on the podcast before. It was supposed to happen at UFC 288 uh, a few weeks back. But uh, that fight got canceled. It got bumped a few weeks later. Daniel Santos taking on Johnny Munoz Jr. The line for this one, Santos minus 215. With Munoz coming back at plus 185. So money line wise, I think this is dogger pass at this point. Just because Santos does get taken down. He has been put flat on his back. Uh, you know, just as recently as the Castaneda fight, we saw that. I know he was getting hurt by shots in that fight, uh, but I just think that he has been put on bottom enough uh, to put some pause in a land this minus 200 juice. Um, you know, the guy also got rocked several times versus Castaneda. It was really hard to put away and, you know, ended up coming at Castaneda and finishing him in the second round. Pretty incredible comeback and just, uh, cardio performance there the way he was able to to persevere through all that adversity and come back and win that was incredible uh but the guy did get hurt a lot and i think he's you know susceptible to getting taken down by munoz here munoz definitely steadily improving still a young fighter and I think the guy has, you know, been improving all areas of his game, his striking, his wrestling, just getting more comfortable ever since, you know, getting some wins in the UFC. And I just think at this point it is Munoz or pass. I definitely don't think it's a bad bet on Munoz um, because I think he could hit takedowns here and definitely keep Santos on his back. He's likely going to have to keep him on his back the entire time because Santos on the feet uh, has incredible pressure. He has that shoot to box style of striking and he, he mixes it up really well with all of his different strikes and mixes up the targets and we have seen Munoz hurt and knocked out by by gravely not that long ago so you got to think that Santos um, does have the striking advantage probably has the cardio advantage as well just because it seems like this guy will not stop coming so Munoz is likely going to have to hit uh, continued takedowns here but I think he's capable of doing that I mean it, he's definitely um, a comfortable wrestler and grappler that's how he wins most of his fights and I think the path of victory is there so a plus 185 definitely not a bad stab in terms of this fight finishing or going the distance I could see either one happening I could see uh, Munoz potentially submitting Santos on the ground. I could see Santos hurting and knocking out Munoz on the feet. Um, but I don't really have much of a, a concrete um, you know, flag I'm going to plant on the over or under here. I kind of think the prices are about right. And in terms of props here, I think uh, Munoz by decision at 5-1 to one, uh, is an intriguing, uh, an intriguing prop I see on this fight. So... Um, I like that one there. Um, I don't know if I'll end up with a bet there. You know, check check the bet MMA for uh, what I end up end up doing there. Next fight, uh, hilarious fight here. Heavyweight division: Andre Arlovsky, Dante Mays. Odds for this one: 
Mays minus 135, Arlovsky plus 115. Holy shit, man. These guys, I mean, I think if you guys have a money line bet on this fight already, if you have a plus money Mays bet, because he did end up uh, open as the underdog here, I think that's fine. But at this point, I mean, shit, guys, you're, we're talking about picking between two really bad fighters at this point. I mean, Andre Arlovsky is like 45 years old at this point. He has been quitting a lot more recently lately. The Dilema fight was just pathetic, honestly. Uh, you know, Jake Collier soundly beat him. That's the last guy Jake Collier soundly beat. Dante Mays, you know, just, you know, burnt a lot of people in his past two fights, myself included. I mean, two winnable fights for him, and he laid an egg in both of them. I mean, the Sakai fight, he was shut out of the entire time, but the Hamdi fight was really the unforgivable, embarrassing one. Um, so I just can't you know, get myself to trust either one of these guys. You got Mays, uh, who I think has the more clear path to victory here. If he hits takedowns here, Andre probably won't provide much resistance once he gets taken down, might even look to quit if he gets on bottom again. And then uh, Andre, you know, this guy is fucking 45 years old and he just seems to not really be caring that much about his fights nowadays. The guy's getting paid an absurd amount of money and, uh, you know, the guy could just be phoning it in for all we know. So uh, a, a prop that I saw here that uh, my boy Pepe mentioned, Dante Mays by submission, already got uh, already got bet a little bit. I took it at 18-1 to 1 earlier today. It's still at 11-1. to 1. As I mentioned, uh, if Mays is hitting takedowns here, Andre might just give up that neck and, you know, look to get out of there like he's done a few times lately. So not the worst stab there. Next fight is a Bantamweight fight between uh, short-notice Muin Gafarov taking on John Castaneda, Sexy Mexi, one of the best nicknames in the UFC. Odds for this one uh, have Castaneda slight favorite, minus 130. Uh, Gafarov plus 115 uh, on the comeback-ish. So, you know, different prices, different books. Um, 140 on DK with Gafarov coming back plus 120. Um so, you know, pretty good fight here that was put together on short notice. I liked Castaneda a lot in his last fight against um, uh, Mendoza. Uh, that fight got canceled, unfortunately. This is a tougher matchup. Gafarov, the guy's a pretty dedicated wrestler. Not really too impressed with his striking. I think his striking is mostly just swinging a big couple of overhands, looking to get close to his opponents, and then he shoots his takedown. So he knows how to, you know, blend his takedowns with his striking pretty well. Uh, but I don't think his striking is any good at all. And I think his his grappling is, I would say, you know, maybe slightly above average at best. But uh, Castaneda's takedown defenses look pretty good, man. I mean, he stuffed uh, several takedowns in, in the, the Miles Johns fight. He's just, you know, a smooth southpaw operator on the feet. Really like the way he moves around the cage and just has good head kicks, good straight left hand. I think he's a pretty clean boxer, and I think he's the much better striker than Gafarov here. So he just has to stuff takedowns, and I think the striking should be pretty one-sided in his favor. And with his takedown defense looking pretty solid, with him having the full camp here, with Gafarov, uh, you know, boofing his fight on the Contender Series against Chen and, Heil and Heiliger, who we now know is, you know, not a good fighter at all. Um, just not too high on Gafarov. He has looked a lot better in his past two fights uh, since that loss to, to Chad there. But I think this is uh, probably Castaneda's fight here. Not going to endorse Castaneda pre-fight. I'm going to look to see how the, the first takedowns uh, go here because I think Gafarov is going to come out, you know, as I mentioned, throwing those big overhands, looking to take Castaneda down. I want to see how Castaneda reacts to those first takedowns or two, and then you can potentially lie back Castaneda here because I think the second half of the fight should favor him. Uh, I think he's got the better cardio with the full camp as well. And if, he sh if he's stuffing Gafarov's takedowns, I think, uh, you know, he might even be live for a finish in that second or third round on the feet so well, actually you can finish on the ground too the guy you know has a i think he's a brown butter black belt you know submitted uh johns and a fight or two back so uh just any round two three uh, three finish is pretty live for castaneda here um next fight uh welterweight division last fight on the prelims aleski elizu zaleski dos santos taking on abu babkar and nurmaga madoff pretty fun fight here pick a mods uh both sides have been betting this uh in this fight pretty heavily um more action on Abu Bakar, though, definitely. Uh, uh, Zaleski was, I think, like minus 150, minus 140 a week or two ago, and then now it's Pickham maybe even trending towards uh, Nurmagomedov as the favorite. Um, so Zaleski is coming off a pretty decent layoff, year-and-a-half layoff. I think he's coming off a USADA suspension. 
He also is 36 years old, and he's just had a a very long career, a lot of wars, you know, know, been kind of known for just getting and trading in the pocket and just having some really good fights. The guy is a really entertaining fighter. At one point, had a really solid win streak, you know, seven wins in a row. Good wins, too. Mario Akhmedov, um, Max Griffin, Sean Strickland. Uh, Lyman Good, I mean, the guy at one point was a, a, on a really good run there. Um, I definitely think he's probably past his prime at this point. Um, but still, I think, uh, you know, as we saw in the uh, the Benoit St. Denis fight, uh, I know Benoit was uh, a lightweight in that fight, moving up to welterweight. But still, we saw Zaleski uh, is pretty sharp in there as well. And... Abu Bakr, man, I mean, the guy is, is skilled. He He's a skilled fighter. He, he knows how to fight in all areas of the fight. He's a very risk-adverse fighter, um, fights to win decisions, 7-0 um, <clears throat> and 0 in decisions in his career. But he's been in the UFC now for uh, almost four years, right? Uh, yes, coming up on four years. And who's his best win? Uh Gadji Omar Gadjiev, who's 0 and 2 in the UFC, Jared Gooden, who is, you know, 1 and 3 in the UFC. The guy has been in the UFC for a long time. He hasn't fought many guys, and the guys he has fought are no good. They're no good at all. I honestly think that uh, Zaleski's win over a lightweight Benoit Saint Denis is m- better than anything Abu Bakr has done uh, in the UFC. I mean, just his entire. Um, MMA resume, I mean, just super weak. I mean, his PFL fights just didn't fight anybody good, really. Um, and, you know, so I just think Abu Bakr is a pretty underwhelming, right? You're looking at a, a guy who's a decision type of fighter, and uh, I think he's probably at a striking disadvantage here. I think he's going to have to mix in the clinch and the wrestling to, to get Zaleski down. But Zaleski's historically had pretty solid takedown defense. Definitely not been easy to get down. Um, so... You know, I, I see why this one is pick'em. I, I do think either guy could win this fight. It wouldn't really surprise me. I'm going to go with Zaleski at this point. I just think he's the more dangerous striker. He's going to do more damage in this fight. And I think that, um, you know, probably has a higher chance of finishing the fight as well with Abu Bakr just being so, you know, reluctant to use energy. Uh, the guy, very risk-adverse fighter. He's a smart fighter, but I just don't think he really hurts guys in there. So, um I'm going with Zaleski in this one. Um, not really endorsing a, a bet on him. I don't really see any bets on this fight. I like. I'll uh, I'll be looking to live bet this one. But good matchup, honestly. Good good matchmaking. Looking forward to that fight. Probably one of the the best fights on the card. Um, and then we're moving on to the main card now. Lightweight division. Jamie Malarkey taking on uh, Mr. Muhammad John. Naimov coming in on very, very short notice here. It was supposed to be a good fight between Malarkey and Guram Kudaladze. Unfortunately, Guram had to pull out of that one. Um, Naimov coming in on super short notice, and he's a huge underdog. <clears throat> Um, as high as plus 400 in some spots. And, I mean, Naimov doesn't look like a good wrestler. I mean, he's been taken down a lot in his fights. Just looks like a below-average defensive wrestler, and I don't think he's anything special on the feet either. So it should be pretty easy work for Malarkey. I think he's probably the better striker, definitely the better grappler, and he's got a really good uh, gas tank as well. Should be able to just repeat takedowns on Naimov all fight and, you know, you know, grind him out. But at a certain point, Malarkey, you know, he did get a new opponent on less than a week's notice. Um, you know, Naimov is getting hit, you know, he's getting grace with a chance to, to get in the UFC here. I mean, this guy got shut out by Colin Anglin just a fight or two ago, and now he's somehow in the UFC. So I, I think, you know, whenever it's a short notice fight, like less than a week's notice, I mean, minus 500 is just too far. Um, I mean, even with our boy uh, Mosfar Ivlaev, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, I mean, he was minus 900 versus a guy in Lopes who nobody really gave much of a chance. And Lopes, you know, put gave him a really, really good fight because, I mean, he was just, you know, tenacious. He was he he, he took his opportunity and, you know, made the most out of it. So I'm not saying that that's likely to happen, but I wouldn't I wouldn't really mess around with any malarkey money line or parlay or anything. Uh, the props aren't out for this one yet. Maybe look at Malarkey sub, Malarkey sub 2-3, um, because, uh, you know, Naimov coming on short notice might fade late. A- any type of 2-3 Malarkey, um, the prices are probably going to be shit. It's probably going to be like plus 500 for round 2, 750 for round 3, but still might be worth a stab just to, to get some action on the fight. Next fight, women's flyweight division, uh, Karine Silva, Ketlin Souza. 
I don't do this often, guys, but I did not watch any footage for this fight. I don't give a fuck about this fight. Uh, there's no chance I'm going to bet this shit. So I didn't even bother watching anything. Silva, um, you know, I bet I bet um, Batello uh, against her uh, a while back. And, uh, you know, she got dropped and, and finished in that fight. Uh, was dead wrong about that one. This woman's, you know, finished almost all of her wins. Ne never, won never won a fight by decision, has Silva. So that's kind of concerning. Uh, and Sosa, her record looks pretty solid. I mean, she's coming over from Invicta, uh, coming off of a few decision victories. Um, so I don't know, man. I don't really have much of a thoughts on this fight. Uh I'm not going to waste much more time, but Sosa is 4-0 in decisions, and Silva's 0-1 in decisions, for what it's worth. So maybe maybe some Sosa decision only. What is that on DK? Oh, they, they're they on to it. It's, uh, it's a near pick -em. So, yeah, nothing of interest there. I don't know. Maybe listen to somebody else for some analysis on this one, but um, you're not going to catch me watching any footage on that one this week. <clears throat> Next fight, uh, flyweight division, Tim Elliott, Victor Altamirano, fucking banger of a fight, two studs, absolute studs here, um, and the odds for this one are Tim Elliott minus 180, Vic plus 155, um, so obviously Tim Elliott in the news lately, um, his boy Kevin Kroom was shagging his wife Gina Mazzani. We know both those fighters. Uh, both those fighters suck. I, I want to give Tim some reassurance here. The Tim is a damn good fighter. This guy is not very athletic. He's you know a scrawny small guy, definitely under average uh, athleticism for the weight class. But he's made it work. He's you know he's got that janky striking. He's got that relentless grappling. The guy's a fun fun fighter to watch. Fun fighter to bet on. As an underdog, uh, but not as a favorite, guys. I mean, we're talking about Tim Elliott, a 36-year-old flyweight. Okay, he has been has been fighting forever. He's been in the UFC for almost 10 years. I mean, no, over 10 years. Uh, uh, quite frankly, insane. Um, and this this guy, you know. Like I said, he's a good fighter to bet as an underdog because he sometimes he's put against you know guys who they who they claim are prospects like Tagiru and Bekov and people write him off and he's a two to one underdog. That's a good spot to bet on him. This type of spot where he's you know a damn near sixty five percent favorite over a surging young prospect in Victor Altamirano. Uh, I don't think oh you know Victor's only thirty two. He's not that young, but you know much younger in fight years. Obviously, uh, only went pro in twenty seventeen. Um, but I think Victor is, is steadily, steadily getting better. And that's, that's something to really consider in this fight is that Elliot, um, he's the fighter that he is. He's not going to be adding any new wrinkles to his game. The guy's essentially been the same fighter for the past five years. Now, Victor is definitely improving fight to fight. He's getting a lot better in the past several years. And that's worth a lot here because I just think that these guys' careers are going in different directions. I think Victor is surging. He's on his way to possibly being ranked in the flyweight division. And Elliot is kind of, you know, hanging around just right at the fringe of the top 10, top 15, you know, got a little lucky in his last fight against Tagir. I bet him in that fight. I did not expect us to win that decision and he did pull it off. Um, but I just think that this is Victor's fight, man. I really do. I think that um, the fight for Victor against Candelario actually inspires a lot of hope in me because Candelario took him down several times in that fight. Victor got up several times in that fight. And the guy just seems to know how to come back from a deficit in a round. He knows that if he gets taken down early in the round and he gets back up, he's coming at your ass throwing head kicks and spamming strikes and he's going to hustle, hustle, hustle to earn that round back. And, you know, I just love to see that. I think that's really relevant here because I could, I could see him getting taken down early here. But then if he gets back up with a minute or two left and he's, you know, the one pressure and spamming volume and getting Elliott backing up, I think he's likely to steal the rounds. And I think on the feet, I just think um, Victor is going to be too quick for for uh, for Tim here. I think that the body kick will be landed. I think the straight punches will be there. And I just like Victor's style, man. I know he's not a good defensive grappler. He could get taken down over and over again here. But it's not like Tim Elliott's known for top control. I mean, he's known for kind of dragging guys down over and over again. And I just think that, that Victor's going to break away from that body lock grip at some points. He's going to be landing strikes on Tim here. And he's probably going to hustle his way to a decision. Uh, so I, I got victor in this fight 
Uh, I think he's more likely to, to get a finish. I think we could see, a, you know, a KO from Victor here more likely than we could uh, a submission or something from Tim. So uh, I like Victor in this fight. Uh, great matchup. I, I, I sympathize with our boy Tim with the, the trouble he's going through here, guys. But he's a 65% favorite here. And that's not the territory where you bet on Tim Elliott. So um, it's Mexico season in this one. Next fight's in the lightweight division. Jim Miller taking on Jesse Butler. Very short notice replacement. Two or three days notice for Jesse Butler. It's a good thing that Jared Gordon's not fighting, though. I mean, that was kind of absurd that he was even booked in this fight, you know, coming off of getting knocked out um, five or six weeks ago. So it's a good thing that they saved uh, Jared there. Um, that would have been a fun fight, though, J Jim Miller versus Jared Gordon. Maybe we can get that book down the line. But Butler is a featherweight here, moving up on short notice, and I just think he's got nothing for Jim Miller. Kind of surprised that this line is even in the minus 200 range. I really struggle to see 30% uh, win equity for Butler here. I mean, the guy looks like a bad striker and grappler. I think, you know, very sloppy grappler. I think he's mostly looking to get the fights on the floor as well. I don't think he's too comfortable at range, and I think Jim Miller is still a pretty dangerous, crafty southpaw. Um... I was watching his, one of his old fights against, you know, Joe Lozon from 10 years ago the other day. And, man, Jim Miller, uh, just really, really skilled fighter, man. The guy's been in the game for 15 years, most fights in UFC history. Um, the guy's just, you know, such a, a great guy. Um, you know, I, I don't know anybody out there that has a negative thing to say about Jim Miller. Truly one of New Jersey's finest citizens. Um, although I do have a bone to pick with him. Last time he came out, he didn't come out the Bad Moon Rising, one of the best walkouts in the UFC, and he switched up the song last time, and, you know, he lost the fight. So hopefully he's back to Bad Moon Rising. I think Jim's going to put this kid in a body bag, honestly. I think he's probably going to finish him. I think he could finish him on the feet with some punches or just, you know, strangle him on the ground. So I think Miller's going to make easy work of this guy. I would be shocked to see Butler win this fight. Moving on to the co-main event in the featherweight division, Alex Caceres, Daniel Pineda, odds for this one. Oh, I didn't even say the odds for the, the last fight, Jim Miller is minus 230, um, by the way. Um, next fight, um, Caceres, Pineda, odds for this one in the co-main event, minus 180 for Caceres, plus 155 for Pineda. Um, so I don't have a, a whole lot of conviction on this one here. Um, you know, Pineda, his fights historically finished. The guy's been a, an incredibly few amount of decisions in his career. Uh, he's 0-5 in decisions uh, in his 42-fight career. So that that's fucking insane, isn't it, guys? He's fought MMA pro 42 times. Actually, 45 times because he has no three no contests. 45 times, and he's never won a decision. That's got to be kind of depressing, honestly. Like the thrill of getting your hand raised in a decision. Uh, I think, uh, you know, some fighters like that. Bobby Green lives on that feeling. Uh, and he's never had that feeling. So um, what, what are the odds for him to win by decision here? Plus 600. Not good enough, I'll tell you that. Um, but, you know, I think Caceres should win the fight here. I mean, uh, a little. we could be seeing a bit of an overreaction here with the recent odds. I mean, uh, you know, Tucker Lutz was just, a, you know, a bigger favorite uh, than Alex Caceres is. And obviously, Alex Caceres is a much better fighter than Tucker Lutz. But, uh, you know, Caceres isn't a guy who exactly, you know, uh, puts big margins on fighters. He's not a guy who wins fights uh, extremely clearly. So I could see this one being close. Pineda's pretty crafty, dangerous as well. Um, so yeah, man, I don't have uh, a whole lot of thoughts here. I won't waste much more time. I think it'll be a Caceres decision. I think it'll be a 29, 28 for Caceres here. Um, but just close fight all around uh, a lot of outcomes on the table and just not a lot of conviction in this one for me. So, um, That'll move us along to the main event, flyweight main event. Great choice for a main event here. Um, you know, some people I think will probably criticize Albazi for maybe not deserving this, but fuck that, man. I mean, we see so many worse main events on a regular basis. Uh, I know he's only 4-0 in the UFC, but I think the guy's looked impressive. He's looked promising. Kaikar France, uh, you know, getting some respect I like to see in the main event. And this is just a fun fight. You know, you got two top 10 guys in the flyweight division. I think it's perfectly deserving of a main event. First non title flyweight main event in, I think, six years or something like that since Moreno and Pettis fought back in August of 2017. Um, so it's a damn sin that these guys haven't, the flyweights haven't gotten more main events, but it's nice to see that they are here. Um, 
Another fight where I don't have a whole lot of conviction. Now, first of all, the odds are a pickup right now, minus 110 on both sides. Uh, more action coming in on Kai Car France throughout the past, you know, couple weeks, months. He was an underdog at some point. Um, but man, I I think this one will go to the decision. You, you guys know my thesis about first time main events in the UFC. The fights always see the fourth and fifth round. You know these these fighters they they realize their their career is moving up. They're fighting in five round fights now. They are a little more um, you know aware of their gas tank. They're conserving energy a little bit, and the fights. I believe, um, see the fourth and fifth round at a very, very uh, high clip. So I think this fight will see the, the championship rounds, will likely hit the cards here. And I'm going to go with Albazi to win the fight. Now, I don't have a, a super clear read on, on how he's going to get it done. I got to think that, you know, um, some takedowns are in, are in the, the picture here for Albazi. Um, you know, some people will point to the, the Askarov fight and say that Kai Car France's defensive grappling looked really good there. I don't know, man. Rewatching that fight this week, uh, it's just, it went a lot differently than how I remembered it. I mean, um, uh, first of all, he got taken down and completely backpacked in round one, dominated in round one, like vir virtually a 10-8 round. I mean, just that you know, was a complete shutout round for Askarov in that fight. And then Askarov, you know, kind of slowed down severely in that second round. He got Kai France down once or twice in that second round, wasn't able to keep him down, and then... Uh, you know, lost the second half of the fight. I thought his cardio looked just uncharacteristically terrible there. Uh, but honestly, guys, I mean, I feel like more often than not, Askarov does win that fight. Um, so, you know, K Kai ran good there. He he won and cashes a plus 300 underdog, uh, which was nice to see. Um, you know, the crowd was definitely behind him in that fight. And, you know, he deserved that, you know, the, the, the interim title shot off of that. But um, I just think the guy's defensive grappling still has holes in it. His takedown defense uh, is not great. Once he's put on his back, I don't think he's super explosive at getting back to his feet. So I could see Albazi getting takedowns here. The striking should be real close between these guys. You know, Kai's a, a, sharp, a sharp puncher. Um, sharp kicker as well, but Albazi's striking and boxing has impressed me as well. So I just think that um, either guy could win the fight on the feet here. And if any guy is winning the fight with grappling, I definitely think it's going to be Albazi. Um, and, you know, I think Kai should probably have the better t uh, cardio out of the two here. But um, as I mentioned, Albazi, young up and coming fighter. It's his first main event. I think the guy's going to be prepared. He's going to be ready to go a full five hard rounds. And I think he's going to get his hand raised at the end of the day, either winning three or four rounds uh, to, to defeat Kai Car France here. So um, no bets I see on the main event that I like so far. Maybe I'll look into some props, maybe some, some props for the fight to start uh, the fourth or fifth round. I believe um, those are actually playable let's see what they are on DraftKings. starts round four minus 190 um yeah i mean maybe i'll just play goes the distance at at, an, at near pick'em price but do expect albazi to win the fight via decision um that is priced at uh plus 380 wow so man looking at the odds for this one they have kaikar france decision plus 175 albazi decision plus 380 so they think it's much more likely that Kai wins the fight via decision if it goes there. I don't understand that. They have decision only KKF minus 200, Albazi plus 150. I think I think Albazi is getting underrated here in terms of his decision equity. So Albazi decision only, his decision prop at 380 I think are good. And the fight just going the distance overall at you know near pick em odds I think will hit in this one. So fun main event, looking forward to that one. I think uh, the fight is is okay. The card is okay. Uh, you know, it took some hits with some injuries, uh, but I think there's overall some entertaining fights. I would say it's you know uh, a solid seven out of ten fight card, uh, fight night card. So um, looking forward to this one. Definitely some underdogs I like in this one. Uh, specifically, uh, Alta Morano I like. Um, um, Jin Yu Fry, Demon Blackshear, Felipe Linz. Uh, don't knock a play on our boy Johnny Munoz either. So yeah, um, no Ozzy this week, but uh, got you guys out of here in just just about 35 minutes. Went a little longer than expected. Um, so thank you all for listening. Make sure you all stay tuned for a action-packed summer of UFC events and podcasts coming at you guys in the next couple of weeks. So hope you all enjoyed the fights this weekend. Hope you all win some bets, and we'll see you all before the next UFC event next week. Peace out, everyone.